<laughs> I like that. Maybe I can do this with one with my mind half my mind tied behind my back. Is that how? That's usually how I do it. Oh, it's pretty good. Pretty good. All right. I will bring you greetings from Waco. Um, I was going to speak on Christmas today. I told when Mike invited me up here, I said, well, yeah, that's Christmas Eve. I said, that'd be a good time to speak on Christmas. He goes, yeah. And I, so I've decided not to. <laughs> uh, I felt everyone had enough of fairy tales this week, so, you yeah, know, we, we'll go with that. But I, I do want to start out today by saying this, that I'm going to give you a lot of numbers today. I'm going to try to explain them as best I can. But uh, there is going to be some very, very, very large numbers in here, and sometimes the mind just can't wrap itself around it. But uh, this will be a series of sermons because... Uh, I think it's very important that we understand this particular subject that I'm getting in today because, um, well, you're going to see. You are going to see. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, for by it elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. We look at that and we just, we just kind of pass over that sometimes and we don't think much about it because we, we look at faith as something that that God's people practice and not question the existence of God. That's just part of who we are. We live our daily lives looking at evidence we can't see, we can't feel or touch by any accounting. But by our accounting, it's enough to know that we were created by a creator. And we know who that creator is according to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, in the word, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him nothing was made that was made, and in Him was life and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Believe it or not, in the scriptures I've just read is a lot of science. There is a lot of science in those few verses. And that's where I'm going to, to go today is into science. Because for many others, belief in a grand designer is what you can only see with the naked eye or discern with human senses. Being creatures of logic, scientists become their, or science becomes their God believing, becomes their God, and they only believe in the evidence of, of what they, their science can prove. To them, there is no God. But over the last few decades, a growing number of former scientists, atheists, evolutionists, different men like that have turned Christian in the light of overwhelming proof of, of a designer, a grand designer of our universe. And they are increasingly documenting their evidence in a growing number of books that are out there. But I'm going to be using one book today that I'll be referencing from, and I'll, I'll reference other books, but I'm going to reference or use this particular one, and it's called The Case for a Creator. If you ever have an opportunity to read this, I highly recommend it. It's by Lee Strobel. Now, the background for Mr. Strobel is this. He became a skeptic of religion and the creator of life when he uh, learned about Dar Darwinism as a young student in college. And after graduating from college, he worked for a major newspaper and went on at graduate school at an Ivy League college. 
Now, his wife turned Christian. And he was spurned by his wife's Christianity, and he began investigating um, the evidence for a creator, not to prove that there was a creator, but to disprove there was a creator. With this in mind, he opened up facts, and he ended up shedding his atheism and embarking on a road to God. He documented his journey to Christianity with this book and a couple others as well that he mentions within the book. But this book, however, is a series of interviews he did with leading scientists in their prospective fields of research. These men are highly respected within their sciences, some of the top men in their field, who themselves had turned Christian based upon undeniable evidences and there are several different sections in this book and like I said it's a fascinating reading. In this book it covers fields such as physics which is one I'm going to cover today, Cosmo cosmology, evolu evolution, astronomy, biochemistry, DNA, he goes into the origins of life and so much more. And like I said this is going to be one of several sermons outlining the complexities of our universe because I, I can't do it all in one sermon. There's just too much. You wouldn't believe it. I didn't believe it. These sermons will demonstrate through the voices of these sciences that we were created by God and not by happenstance. And when you put all the evidence together presented by this book, you can't help but come away with a stronger faith. It's hard to believe that you could even po it would be even possible for God's people to have a stronger faith, but when you read what these men have written, you can. The simple fact is, what you've been told all your life that science disproves the, the uh, great creator of the universe, as the Bible tells us, it's just the opposite. Science proves the existence of God. Without a shadow of doubt. I'm going to do a sermon on several of these sections, but I thought, like I said, I would begin with something that it's totally unfamiliar with me, so I never was good in math, so I have a little hard time with some of these numbers sometimes. But I, it was unfamiliar until I read this book. And they make it very clear, very, very poignant in looking at it. What it's called, what they call it, is the fine-tuning of the universe. It is greater part of proof in other sciences as well, so I'm not just going to abrogate it to this one sermon because there's fine-tuning in, in man, there's fine-tuning in our environment, there's fine-tuning in solar system, there's fine-tuning in everything that we look at, DNA, molecules. And you'll understand what that term means more as I go through this. Now scientists have viewed that there's something very uncannily perfect about our universe. The laws of physics and the values of physical constants seem, as one scientist put it, just right. If even one of a host of physical properties in our universe had been just a smidgen different, planets and galaxies never would have formed. Life would have been all but impossible It, one of the scientists said, or one of, one of them wrote, it said that the cosmo exists on a razor's edge. That's how fine-tuned it is. An extreme variance one way or another, and it would not exist. It could not exist. Now take, for instance, the neutron, and here's where we're going to get into these numbers a little bit. And I'll explain it in a little bit of understandable way here in just a little bit. But the neutron is 
zero zero one three seven eight four one eight seven zero times heavier than a proton. Wrap your mind around that. Which allows it to decay into a proton. Electron neutrino, a process as determined in relative abundance of hydrogen and helium that came after the Big Bang and gave the universe to be able to be dominated by hydrogen. Now, if the neutron to proton mass ratio were even slightly different, we would be living in a very different universe. One perhaps with far too much helium in which stars would have burned out too quickly or life to evolve or in one which protons decay into neutrons rather than the other way around, leaving the universe without atoms. So in fact, we wouldn't be living here at all. We wouldn't exist. That's just one. Further examples of fine tuning, uh, they just abound. They're, they're just all over in science. Tweak the change of electron, for instance, or change the strength of the gravitational force to the strong nuclear force just a smidgen, and the universe would look very different and likely be lifeless. The challenge for physicists is explaining why such physical parameters are what they are, because they can't, without falling back to a grand designer. And they don't want to do that. A lot of them don't. Another way of looking at this is a finely tuned constant is a strong nuclear force. That's the force that holds atoms together. The sun burns by fusing hydrogen higher elements, it burns them together, or fuses them together. And when the two hydrogen atoms fuse, it's at 0.7% of the mass of hydrogen is converted into energy. If the amount of matter converted were slightly smaller, 0.6%, instead of 0.7%, a proton could not bond to a neutron and the universe would consist only of hydrogen. With no heavy elements, there would be no rocky planets or no life or anything such as that. If the amount of matter converted were slightly larger, 0.8%, now we're talking about less than 1%, 0.8%, fusion would happen so readily and rapidly that no uh, solar system and no, uh, could come into being and no uh, system of life could ever exist. So the number must lie exactly between 0.6% and 0.8%. Another example given in the book that might help you understand it a little bit better, it did me, and it's given by a former arms control negotiator for President uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. His name is, Reagan, uh, is Patrick Glenn, and he's the associate director for the George Washington University of Institute for Communication Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. Also has a doctorate from Harvard University. He puts it this way. He based his studies on, a, on the term anthropic principles derived from the Greek work anthropic for man. That's what it means, for man. And created from a paper called Large Numbers written by Brandon Carter, a physicist. The anthropic principle states, all seemingly arbitrary, unrelated constants in, in physics have one strange thing in common. There are precise values you need if you want to have a universe capable of producing life. Mr. Glenn, in the light, of this, in, in the light asks this question, is it pure coincidence that the laws of nature are such that life is possible? To answer his own question, we come up with an example given by him on fine-tuning. In his own words, and I, and I just visualize this, astronauts, they land on the planet Mars, and they find a biosphere, kind of like the one they built out in Arizona here a few years back, and it's capable of sustaining life in every way. Inside, they find a control panel filled with the dials that adjust temperature, gravity, air ratios, everything else that deals with human environment. 
Everything is set to perfect upon their, uh, their arrival. Oxygen ratio is perfect. There's a system for replenishing air, a system for producing food and disposing of waste. Each dial has a huge range of possible settings, and if you just one or more of the settings just a little bit, the whole environment would go out of whack. Life would become impossible within the dome. Okay. You got that visualized? All right. Using our own visual visualization, let's look at this example of gravity. Imagine a wooden ruler or one of those old-fashioned linear dials on a radio, you know, where you turn the dial and the little finger went across the numbers. And it spread all the way across the universe as we know it. And it's set to one-inch increments all the way across which means there would be billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of one-inch increments. Well, that entire dial, that entire ruler, represents the range of force strength in nature. You know, you'll hear that word some a little bit. Now, gravity being the weakest force in that range and a strong nuclear force that bonds po protons and, and neutrons together in the nuclei being the strongest, a whopping 10,000 billion, 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 billion times stronger than gravity, the range of possible settings for the force of gravity can plausibly take in to be at least as large as a total range of force of strength, one end or the other of the ruler. So the whole in one end of the ruler to the other is the range of force. It has a direct bearing on everything that is encompassed within it. Now let's imagine that you want to move the dial from where it's currently set. If you were to move it by one inch, the impact on life on this universe would be catastrophic. That's just one inch out of billions and billions and billions and billions in the range of force. One way or the other. One inch compared to the whole universe would make any life on Earth impossible larger than the size of a bug. If Earth exists. The life that did exist would have to have legs so big to support themselves that they would be unable to move effectively. One part in 10,000 billion, 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 the total range of strength in nature, fine-tuned, would change this whole world, the galaxy, everything that we know. So, and there are many other examples of fine-tuning that just can't be ignored. The takeaway conclusion would be to someone like you and me that there's a great deal of care to make everything perfect in our universe for our existence. Einstein once said this, what really interests me is whether God had any choice in the creation of the world. And what he meant by this question was, when he formed the world, as he said in Genesis 1-1, if you turn there and read that, he says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering above the face of water. So what Einstein was asking in this question was, if he was going to create man for a place on a planet on the earth in the way that he did, he had to have everything set to perfect, perfect, perfect way for man to exist. This is a fundamental com question. Compared to this question, all other questions really seem trivial. He had a choice if he wanted to cr create a blank universe. 
but he didn't. That's not what he did. So in order to create a universe where life is possible with the same set of natural laws as ours, it seemed that he had the only limited choices in how he could set it up. It's like when you build a house, there are certain things that you just have no choice that have to be done a certain way. Everything had to be perfect. According to recent findings, the values of physic physical constants should have been, had to be fine-tuned to make the emergence of life in this universe possible. And the whole universe had to be perfect for this world to exist. And I'll get into that more in my second sermon. God is a designer of our world and made it ready for us to live upon. He made perfect oxygen that has made it perfect it's perfect for us to breathe the perfect amounts gave us trees and plants that recycle the air perfectly the way we need it done God gave us food and water supply able to replenish itself upon this world and God fine-tuned our universe and our planet down to the very atom other examples of fine-tuning can be found in areas such as astronomy and some of the other areas. But let me give you uh, just a few of these right quick. And, and I want you to take this example and put it in your mind as I give you these numbers. Remember the old adage, you take, would you take a, a million dollars or would you take a penny doubled every day for 30 days? Take the penny. My calculators used to only go to like 24 times itself. That's as far as it would go and it was up in the millions. Well, fine-tune it. There's constants in the universe, and one of those things are is a ratio of electrons and protons, and that's 1 to the 37th power. Ratio of electromagnetic force of gravity, expansion rate of, is, or electrons and proton ratio of is 1 to the 40th power. Electro force of gravity is an expansion rate of the universe is... 1 to the 55th power. Mass of density to the universe is 1 to the 59th power. And the constant of the universe, this means that things remain the same and, and that this earth is able to sustain life is the cosmological constant is 1 to 120th power. That's taking 1 and double it 120 times you would wind up with just an unbelievable number. These numbers represent, represent the maximum deviation from accepted values that would either prevent the universe from existing now or not having matter or be unsuitable for any form of life. Now, the degree of fine-tuning is difficult to imagine. Dr. Hugh Ross gives us an example of, of the least fine-tuned of the above four examples in the book, The Creator and the Cosmos, which is represents, represented in this, this illustration. He says, one part in thir 10 to the 37th power is such an incredibly sen sensitive balance that it is hard to visualize. The following analogy might help. Cover the entire North American continent in dimes all the way up to the moon. A height of about 239,000 miles. Now, in comparison, the money to pay for the U.S. federal debt would cover one square mile less than two feet deep with dimes. Next pile of dimes from here to the moon on a billion other continents the same size as North America. Paint one dime red. Mix it in all those other dimes. And the odds, and pick a friend. Just pick any friend you want. Doesn't know where you put the dime. In any one of those billion continents filled with dimes all the way to the moon. And it's like he would turn around, walk out, and stick his hand in and pull that one red dime out. Incredible if it was accidental, but it's not.
The ripples in the universe from the original Big Bang event are detectable at one part in 100,000. If this factor were slightly smaller, the universe would only exist as a collection of gas. No planets, no life. And if this factor were slightly larger, the universe would consist only of black holes. Obviously, no life would be possible in such a universe. Fine-tuning isn't a theory, folks. It's not a theory. It's real. Scientists are struggling to come to grips with this. And they are theorizing everything under the stars to offset it so that they don't have to explain it so they can deny a grand designer. Everything from multiple universes to what they call everything theory and on and on. But they offer no proof for these any other theories. But fine tuning exists. One scientist named Collins said an unexpected, counterintuitive, and strongly precise setting of the cosmo cosmological constant is widely regarded as a single greatest problem facing physics and cosmology today. Skeptics say it can't be because of a designer of the universe, a creator of the universe. But a Harvard biologist named Richard Lewinton once admitted, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constraints, in spite of failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of a tolerance of scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories because we have prior commitment a commitment to materialism, rejection of existence of anything divine or supernatural. It's not that the methods and in intuitions of the scientists somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the, on the contrary, that we are forced by our prior presumptions, adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of invest investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that the materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow divine foot in the door. And that was written... And the name of the article was Billions and Billions of Demons, a New York Review, January 9, 1997. Psalms 14.1 says, and here we go again, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works, and there is none who does good. The Eternal looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Do we even seek God? Do we even try? Does man even try? I don't know how many articles I've written. I wrote two or three articles this week, and I've wrote so many others about Christmas. But the ones I posted this week on Facebook and different things like that, all I got back in response was Merry Christmas. <laughs> They have all turned aside. They have come together to become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Scientists, through their undying faith in Darwinism, seek to find ways to deny God as their creator. Problem is, his handiwork just keeps popping up all over the place. You know, it, places where it shouldn't be. God is being proven by science in closing one's eyes to make it seem different. It's just ludicrous. It's like when God addressed Job, we see the truth in his description of his creation and the eternal reveals his omnipotence to Job. In Job chapter 38, we'll start in verse 1. Job chapter 38 and verse 1. And this goes on when Job is being corrected by God. And he says, Then the eternal answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens the counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have an understanding. So he laid the foundation. He set it out. He created it. He set everything the way it needed to be prepared. Now prepare yourself like a man, I will question you. Verse 5, who determined the measurements? We just went through 
one measurement of the universe and what and and the fine tuning of it. And he's saying, Job, did you did you sit there and figure that out? Did you consider the physics and what it would take? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened, or who laid the cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for glory? Or who shut the sea with the doors and when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band? When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors? And when I said, This far you may come, and but no further, and here your proud waves must stop? Have you commanded, commanded the morning since your days begun and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked... Uh, be shaken out of it it takes on form like clay under the seal and stands out like a garment from the wicked their light is withheld and the uprised harm arm is broken have you entered the springs of the sea have you walked in search of the depths and you know one of the fascinating things if I can break in here right now a guy wrote a book and I forgot what it is right now and the name of it but he goes and shows where many of the scriptures in the Bible that were written many thousands years. Job is considered probably one of the oldest books in the Bible. And he shows where in Job and different places in the Bible that some of these things that he says like springs in the seas and currents in the seas and different things like that actually exist. They didn't know that even up to 200 years ago. And scientists who looked at these words went out and they discovered, yes, there's currents in the seas. There's springs in the seas. There's different things that he has talked about that are in these scriptures. So these words have science of, they have meaning in them, they have direction. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breath of earth? Tell me if you know all of this. Can you bind, and drop down to verse 31, can you bind the clusters of Pleiades or lose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Maseroth in its season? Can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of heavens? So there are ordinances of heavens that have to be considered, that have to be calculated, that have to be added into our thinking. Can you set their dominion over earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds, and abundance of the water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Some people believe that, that, that he's talking about like the telephone, because the telephone sends out an electric pulse, and on the other end, that electric pulse turns into words. It's lightning he's talking about that turns into words. Who has put wisdom in the mind or has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Who can pour out the bottles of heavens when the dust hardens in clumps and the clods cling together? Here's a quote from Lee Strobel out of the book, The Case for the Creator. The everyday function in the universe is in itself a kind of ongoing miracle. The coincidences that allow the fundamental properties of matter to yield to a habitual environment are so improbable, so far-fetched, so elegantly orchestrated that they require a divine explanation. In other words, the momentary abrogation of laws of nature in a sudden, visible, and direct way, what we usually call a miracle, obviously points toward an all-powerful deity. I thought those were very striking words. You know, the resurrection of Christ and his ability to heal the sick and raise the dead are direct results of such abrogation, abrogation of such laws of nature, of our science, of our world, of, 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 of everything that we know. We can't do it. We can pray for those things to happen. How can one not take notice of Jesus' providence in our universe? as him being the creator as we read in John chapter 1 verse 1. And as he said to Job, he gave his minds to think with the ability to seek him out based upon what we can see. So we can see God. 
You know, scientists have numerous roles in society, all of which involve exercising curiosity in order to seek out questions and seek out answers about our universe and about our life. But this involves using scientific me methods, con construct a testable question, make a prediction, perform tests, interpret the resulting data. They are to f their, their teaching is that they are to follow the evidence wherever it leads them. That's their job. It's not to ignore data because it doesn't fit your template of beliefs. And I would say that's the same for mankind, even for people in God's church. Job learned a lesson in, hum in humility, and eventually these men will too. It's almost mind-boggling to contemplate this incredible degree of, re of required cosmic fine-tuning out there. And so you have to ask yourself, why would scientists be uncomfortable with it? Because it, 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 it leads to the best explanation of all the facts presented. And that is that a, there is an ultra-intelligent mind engineered and orchestrated all of this. Let me give you another set of numbers. A conservative estimate of evidence presented the universe was created from nothing was fine-tuned from the exist for the existing man is one part in 100 million billion 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 billion. Now if you put that into a number form it would be 10 followed by 53 zeros. Put it this way, let's say you were, in, you were out in space and you were looking at Earth, a little blue marble out there. You're way out in space and Earth is just a little, little bitty blue marble. And you throw a dart, just throw a dart at it. You're trying to hit a target. And you hit the bullseye. But here's the kicker. The bullseye is one trillionth of one trillionth of an inch in diameter. That is less than the size of just one atom. From out in space, you hit that bullseye. It just goes on and on, the proof of fine-tuning by God and the universe. Up, and there's up to 34 proofs. I brought a printout of them. I'll leave here with you if you want to look at them. And some of them are as follows. The electromagnetic coupling, coupling of the constant binds electrons to protons and atoms. If it were smaller, fewer protons would be held. If it was larger, electrons would be held too tightly to bond with other atoms. Ratio of electrons to pro proton mass, one point. 1836. Again, if this was larger, smaller molecules cules could not form. Carbon and ox oxygen nuclei have finely tuned energy levels. Electromagnetic and gravitational forces are finely tuned so that the right kind of star can be stable. Our sun is the right color. If it was redder or bluer, photosynthesis response would be weaker. Our sun is also the right mass. If it was larger, its brightness would change too quickly and there would be too much high energy radiation. If it were smaller, the range of planetary distance able to support life would be too narrow. The right distance would be so close to the star and the tidal forces would disrupt the planet's rotational period. <laughs> UV radiation would also be inadequate for photosynthesis. The Earth's distance from the sun is crucial for a stable water cycle. Too far away and most water would freeze. Too close and most water would boil. The Earth's gravitational axle, axle, axle tent, rotation period, magnetic field, crust and thickness, oxygen, nitrogen ra ratio, carbon deox dioxide, water vapor, and ozone levels are all just perfectly right. And that's just a few, and on and on it goes with different sciences. And, and you have to wonder how, as I said earlier, how, God, how man can deny God any longer. Science was once the enemy of God, now it's a presenter of evidence proving God to all humanity. A NASA astronomer, astronomer John O'Keefe, wrote, we are, astronomical st we are by astronomical standards pampered 
cosseted, cherished group of creatures. If the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is in my view that these circumstances indicate the universe was created for man to live in. What is all this for? Why did God create this for man? Why do we exist on a small ball in the middle of the seemingly endless expanse of, of, of stars and universes and solar systems? Where does the, in the universe we live on the razor's edge? Psalms 8 tells us of what, what we're here for. When, and in Psalms 8 verse 3 he says, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him in dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through your paths of the sea. O eternal, our eternal, how excellent is your name in all the earth. But you know, when God was fine-tuning this universe for man to exist on, he wasn't just thinking about this earth and the universe and, and the galaxy and the solar system. He was thinking far, far beyond that. He not only made this world perfect for us in the, in the universe, but the spiritual world as well. The truth of our God for, is that, that we can't change what we see and what we feel and everything else with simple hypotheses. What is not a hypothesis is we're here for a reason and all the fine tuning is really temporary because we're temporary. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4.18, he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 18. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This world and man are going through changes that scientists can't detect, that earthly men can't see or visualize in their minds. I ask the question, when I think about this, and I think about these men who went out and they investigate the, the heavens and they investigate the atom and they investigate the molecule and they investigate all these other things in such a way, like this Lee Strobel. I ask the question, why is it men who are so intelligent as these men are, who are so given blessed, given this, this blessed ability to understand these things and see these things and detect these things, that they look at every aspect of an atom from one in way to another, or every aspect of the universe from one way to another, and they find the Creator in those things. They find that there is God there. Yet they turn around and they will not use the same scientific diligence in their findings on how God wants them to worship Him. It's like, okay, I found Him, that's enough. Now I believe. Where is that drive? That aspect of correctness within their hearts it, it, it's like they go no further than what they they just find it their science would take them on and on and on until they got a complete explanation but when it comes to religion they just stop at the door Romans chapter 1 verse 18 he says Romans chapter 1 verse 18 he says for the wrath of God is revealed and from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because they may because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of his world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God they did not glorify him as God 
nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish, foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Like Christmas. They changed the glory of God into, into Christmas. Every year we hear, let's put Jesus back in Christmas. And like Nick said the other night, what if he doesn't want to go? What are you going to do? They drink the same Kool-Aid as the rest of the world drinks after they've, after they've gone through all of this trouble of seeking God, trying to prove Him, believing in men's agendas instead of going a little bit further past even man's own vision of what God is. And it's the very same, the same thing that drove them to find God that has covered their eyes from seeing God. Deep thinkers of science, these men did God a service. But as men of God, they have shallow faith. But you, as it says, all this is temporary because God has only just begun. And that's not the Karen Carpenter song. or one. He's going to fine-tune everything, even the spiritual world. Revelation 21.1. Revelation 21.1 Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. They're going to be gone. Something is going to change. That inch is going to move. That ruler is going to move. Something is going to change. It all passes away because it was temporary. Temporary for the, for the sake of man. He says, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. He's going to fine-tune a world for a new creature, for a new set of creatures, for a new set of people. As he says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, You are a new creature in Christ. And in that fine-tuned existence, in that world that we will exist in, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and he, there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain or former things that pass away. And he says in verse 5, he says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end of all things. And I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to those who thirst. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. A new way of life will come into effect. And the laws won't be able to be interpreted in any other way than coming from our Creator. You know, there was this one scientist, his name is Fred Drake, and this is a quote from him. He says, These are inflammatory times, and the cost of atheism has just gone up. Now, I've only touched the beginning of this book because... When I first started reading the book, I, I read about the first quarter of it, it, it like you do a normal book, just page after. And, and then as I got into it, and I, start, I, I started methodically started writing things down, and I had to because I just had to put those thoughts out and stuff. It's just the way it is. So I hadn't made it all the way through the book yet. But it's a book worth buying and reading. It's called The Case, of Crea the Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. And it certainly says that you can find God through science. We can find a creator through science. But it takes a great mind to truly understand God. It takes an open mind to truly understand God. It takes God to understand God because he has to open our minds and eyes. 
But it also takes a heart and a mind willing to bend to His ways. And he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who sits in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your names, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now can you see that day? standing before God, and he asked this question. How is it that you could find faith in me within an atom, but you couldn't follow me in this world? But here's the kicker of the whole thing. I don't want my faith based upon science. It helps. I'll give it that. It's, and it's great for those who may be a little bit skeptical about it, it's nice that hard proof can be collected for those who need it. But I want to have faith because I believe in God, not because science told me to. Or told me He was real. I want to know God is real for myself within my heart. And that I came to Him in that way. But if you are like many others who need proof, and as the Pharisees once said, show me a sign, then you can find it. It's here. Spend $5 on the book and a couple of days reading it. Believe me, you'll come away. You will come away with a lot stronger faith. And faith comes in many ways. And we spent many hours discussing how to gain faith in one's life and how faith works. And if we're willing to God or willing to listen to God, He will show us how to acquire even more faith. Even in places where we were told as children and young people that God didn't exist. Turns out God was there all along. 